now that I realize I was filming the wrong one. Paul's old house in the dark, it's kind of hard to see. 7 Cavendish Avenue. Another band used to record. It took me a minute to find this one. So I got it all boarded up. I try to keep people like me away. This is Cavendish Avenue. Right around the corner from Abbey Road. Nice little neighborhood. Leicester Square, right here. I want to be your man. Yeah. And the Beatles wrote it for them and made them famous. Talk about how you met the Beatles. I met them when they were all fairly unknown and they used to go to clubs in this area, Piccadilly area, and used to sort of spend all night drinking and having a good time. Yeah. That's, don't waste any more, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell me about this rap that you seem to like so much. You don't like it or you do? No, I'll tell you how I know about all these things because we, I used to work selling big posters of the pop stars. Mm -hmm. Tommy Steele, you no know Tommy Steele, oh, yeah. Cliff Richard, yep. Billy Fury, Adam Faye, right. all before the Beatles. Right. Then the Beatles came, Dave Clark Five, Herman's Hermits, uh, the Rolling Stones. We used to travel around on working, selling photographs on the tours. That's how we knew them. Before they became big stars, they were on the bill of big stars, you right. know, like Roy Orbison, Joe Richard. Berry, they opened up for Little Richard. Richard. They were only on the bill then. Right. So they the weren't opening, yeah. inaccessible. They used to mix with everybody else who was traveling. 
How about you? What do you have to say for the camera here? Well, he, he's, led a, he's led a very sheltered life. He was in Dartmoor for 20 years. Alright. Well, thanks for selling me a couple of little pins here. What, what happened? He murdered 10 people who were filming him. Oh, and I he better got, get going. And he got sent to prison for 20 <laughs> I years. I suppose I he's better just get come going. Out. He, he doesn't want to do it again. I better get going if he's a murderer. Okay, thank you for the no, interview. No, you're very welcome. As much as you want. Appreciate it. Those are cute, those little English hats. Cop hats. Yep. <laughs> this is it. We're here. He's from Seattle. I live right by him where he, Jimmy was uh, born.
Sam Phillips, the founder of Sun Records in Memphis, Tennessee, was in at the beginning. Not only did he discover Elvis, he also launched Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy Orbison, and Carl Perkins. Country and Western and rhythm and blues came together in the new explosive form. I wanted it in the raw soul. I mean, I wanted it raw. Those were fantastic times for us because we felt that we were doing something.
several row. And you know what happened up there, don't you? Up there is where the famous rooftop jam happened. Up a row. From the Let It Be movie, you can see this. Mercy Babies Bands. Mercedes. Well, that's kind of cool. But before we get started, let me change the batteries. Yeah, I better put you here. I have information. Well, can I leave my Mercedes? My name is Kelly and I'll be your guide today as we explore the streets of London where the Fab Four uh, played and worked and lived. Um, you know, most people associate the uh, Beatles with a place up north. A very cold place up north, actually, Liverpool. Oh, it's wonderful, though. But of course, of course, it's right. They, they were born there, grew up there, had their early success as a band there. But from 1962 onward, the centre of their lives shifted here to London, and it remained here throughout the course of their career together. So most of the most famous places associated with the Beatles are here in London, not up in Liverpool. Well, with the exception of Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, you won't find those down here. And Just about everything else board. is here. So, on the tour today, I'm going to try to show you examples of various bits and pieces where they played or worked or lived uh, on the tour today. If you have questions at any time, please feel free to uh, ask, I don't mind. And uh, the tour will last approximately two hours. We finish up out at Abbey Road. That's just a, a couple of uh, underground stops back here to Green Park, so it's not that uh, far away. My name is Kelly, by the way. This is City Walks Beatles Tour, so I hope you're all in the right place. Oh, good. That's what I wanted to hear. Now, why do we start our tour at Green Park? 
Well, it's not because of the John Lennon limo in the window over there. That was just put in about four months ago. We've been doing the tour here for over four years. Actually, it's not even to do with a building located right across the road here. But it is a Beatles place. In fact, have any of you heard the nasty rumor been going around for a few years that the Beatles broke up? Has anyone heard this rumor? Yes. Yes, a couple people. <laughs> right. Well, you know, they don't make albums anymore called the Beatles, but they certainly have played on each other's albums, given each other songs. I mean, they still know each other. But they are definitely still united in business. In fact, the present-day offices of Apple are right there, in the Stratton Street building there with the bowed out window. It's still run by Neil Aspinall, even though they only have one office nowadays instead of an entire building. Neil Aspinall started out as the Beatles road manager in 1960, and although he still looks pretty much the same, he has a lot less hair. Is it number one there, right there, right above the street sign? Right there, yeah. That's it. Now, Aren't, aren't they like going through a lot of like uh, eagle battles? Right. Well, right? their major so, occupation today appears to be to sue people. Yeah. Uh, the big one against Apple Macintosh was just resolved a couple of days before Christmas. You see, um, Apple, when it first started out as a company, the owner of it actually said he was a big Beatles fan. That's why he was naming the company Apple. So he couldn't very well turn around and say it had nothing to do with the Beatles company. So the Beatles made an agreement that he could call it Apple as long as he never produced anything related to music. Well, as you all know, most of the top 40 today is made by computer and not musician. And as a result, I know I'm a snob, aren't I? But as a result, um, Apple Macintosh in the States wanted to come out with a computerized keyboard. There's a little problem. Beatles in London. Uh -huh. So, lawsuit took place. Now, nobody seemed to know the final outcome of it. It was all kept very secret, but I had a man on my tour who worked for uh, Apple Macintosh, and he told me, each of the remaining three Beatles got eight million pounds. Not bad for not even having to turn up in court. Not bad for a day's work. In any case, that is the Apple office. They also put out the Beatle doll. It came out a few years ago. So those are officially marketed uh, Apple um, merchandise. And it's nice to know the Beatles still make a little bit of money off their likeness since uh, Lennon McCartney's music is owned by Michael Jackson. So there you are. Now, there's another reason, though, because he just moved in here six months ago. And uh, I think it was rather nice of him to move right in where my tour starts. But actually, we've come here to Green Park because Paul McCartney used Green Park for a video he made a few years ago. It was actually five years ago. It's his 1987 video for the album Press to Play. The song's called Press. And if you remember that video, you may remember Paul going up and down the lift. Do you remember the video in the underground? Yes. Jumping on and off trains? Yes. Well, that, that's the video. And it was filmed here on the Jubilee line that goes through uh, Jubilee, you know, I mean, through Green Park here all the way out to St. John's Wood. In fact, it's the only line that goes to St. John's Wood, and I think that's why Paul chose it, for sentimental reasons. St. John's Wood being not only where Abbey Road Studios is located, but also where Paul had his London residence throughout the 60s. You'll be seeing both of them later on in our tour today. You know, it was funny, when they were trying to make the uh, video, they were having all sorts of problems with uh, London Underground. They wanted to shoot in the middle of the night. So finally, they just walked in in the middle of the afternoon with a cameraman and assistant and a playback. Uh, during the course of the three to four hours they were on the underground system, you may remember from the video, Paul's recognized, very rarely, um, how times have changed. Just 28 years before, Green Park was backed up all the way here past uh, the park, way past, with screaming teenagers fighting to get a glimpse of the Beatles as they arrived for a film premiere. So perhaps Paul remembered that, I don't know. But uh, it was kind of a fun video to make, and that was filmed. You may remember it. Don't worry if you didn't come on the underground today, you'll get your chance to see that hideous underground line. It's still the same awful colors of orange and yellow that they were when Paul filmed on them. So that's the underground line we take out to St. John's Wood. I would ask you, as we're about to get started here, to please keep your own safety in mind on the tour. It's a nice small group today, so I'm not going to leave anyone behind. Take your time getting across the road. I'd also ask that you take a look inside the Ritz Hotel as we go past it, see the sort of place it is. Because I'm going to tell you a little beetly event that took place there once we get round the other side of it. All right, so here we go. Out of this way. Can you do me a favor? Sure. You don't film me constantly. It's rather off putting to have a camera in my face the whole time. So we're definitely working class. Ringo Starr was born in the top area of uh, Dingle. by the local council for people who couldn't afford 
to rent our own. This is for working class families. They had two rooms upstairs, two rooms downstairs. It didn't matter how many people were in the family. Now that was all right in the McCartney household, but I don't know where the Harrisons put them all. You know, there were five siblings. Where were they all during that time? In any case, John was actually not working class, which I know is uh, disillusioning occasionally to some people, but he was actually lower middle class. He lived with his Aunt Mimi and Uncle George, who actually had their own little semi-detached bungalow. You've been to Liverpool, haven't you? So yes, you sir. saw where John grew up. It's got a garden in the front and in the back. It's quite different from the other people homes. In fact, he lived there with just his aunt and uncle. His Uncle George worked for the local dairy ration brand. So they were pretty well off. In fact, Aunt Mimi did not approve of Paul McCartney, which I find rather funny. But there you are. Paul turned up at his house and he said, ooh, he's a working class boy. What's he doing in my home? Who's the sort John is hanging around with, you know? She was very much a snob about it. But Paul's first visit was memorable to Paul for another reason. John Lennon said that Paul walked in the front door and his jaw dropped open. John said, what's wrong with you? Paul said, I've never seen one of those in a private home before. My Liverpool accent never gets any better, by the way. He was pointing at his set of Encyclopedia Britannica. Right. He'd never seen one except in his school library. Couldn't imagine someone actually owned an entire set. John also called his uh, aunt and uncle Mater and Pater. And by the age of 16, John Lennon had read the complete autobiography of Winston Churchill. I don't know too many young teenagers who've done that, you see. So John's background was slightly different. But in any case, it was Britain after World War II. Rationing was still going on into the 50s here in England. So even if they'd had money, which none of them did, there wasn't much to spend it on. George Harrison said once the band got going, he used to refer to them as rock and dolos. They made more money in the unemployment lines than they ever made for many of their gigs. <laughs> so, it must have been quite a heady time for them when once Brian Epstein became their manager. Because in just seven months, Brian Epstein had them their first recording contract. Not bad for a first-time manager, right? Well, what he did after he got the recording contract set up is he moved them down to the President Hotel in Russell Square. I occasionally have people staying there. It's rather a touristy hotel middle range. And the Beatles, what they made their first to the record, they said, they love me give. Yeah, they began to go. Trick question. I know, I'm terrible, aren't I? But anyway, uh, once they did that, they began to move out into uh, other places. George and Ringo moved into bachelor flats in the Mayfair area. John moved into one of Brian Epstein's old flats with his then wife, Cynthia. They moved down into South Kensington. Paul, perhaps always the more family-oriented Beatle, did not fancy the idea of living alone. So he waited until his girlfriend's parents invited him to move in with them. And at the height of Beatle mania, Paul was living in the Asher family's attic bedroom. Don't know, this is not the way I expect rock stars to behave, but there you are. In any case, the Asher family lived in Wimpole Street, which is also Mayfair. So you've got three of the Beatles living right in here. And that's why this became their initial hot spot area. And we'll show you some of the things they used to do down in this area. So, what happened at the Ritz? Well, I'm going to give you all, this is a group participation walk, remember. So I'm going to give you a date and see how well you do. It's March 1969, and two rather personal events took place that month. Anyone there? Not in me. Did a wedding take place, possibly? A wedding? Two weddings. Two weddings took place. Uh, hey, uh, John Lennon folks. married Yoko Ono eight days after Paul McCartney married Linda Eastman. You all know the story of John Lennon's wedding and the ordeal it took to get married from the song The Ballad of John and Yoko. They finally got married in Gibraltar, and they spent their very famous honeymoon at the Amsterdam Hilton, the Bed Inn. You may all remember that now from the photos, etc. But everyone knows about the bedding, but nobody seems to know what was going on back here in London. You see, the McCartneys had no such problem getting married. They walked into the Marleybourne Registry Office, where they emerged ten minutes later to a throng of weeping women, and then they retired here to the Ritz Hotel for their wedding reception. None of the other Beatles were present. Paul had his brother Michael, Mike McGear, of the scaffold as his best man. It was a very small gathering of friends and uh, relations, and that's where the McCartneys held there in the sticks. So right there you can see the division between John and Paul yet again. John with a very public marriage and honeymoon. Paul with a rather private reception back here at the Ritz. So kind of the way he is. That's right. Private so there you go. In any case, 
I'm going to take you over to German Street now. You're going to find it rather interesting because it's the catalyst for a story that has to do with the Rolling Stones as well. Um, German Street has not changed much since 1963, so it's pretty much the same. You can keep that image in mind. Now, in 1963, John Lennon and Paul McCartney were walking along here um, shopping together. Well, he told John and Paul that the Stones were nearby in Soho, rehearsing at Ken Collier's Jazz Club 51. So, they agreed to go over and say hello. They walked down the stairs, right into the middle of an argument that the Stones were having, uh, over what to record for their second single. Their first single had done all right, it had charted, but uh, the Stones were only a cover band at that time, you may remember, that they uh, didn't write any of their own material at this time. So they were at a loss, they were actually arguing over what to record next. Well, John and Paul said they had this song, they hadn't finished or anything, it was only an idea. But if the Stones gave them 10 or 15 minutes, they'd go over in the corner, finish it off, and they could use it if they liked it. So that's what they did. We're walking over in the corner, they get down, came back 10 minutes later, and said, here you go. You can have that if you like it. The lyrics were written out on a little piece of paper, and John and Paul sang it to Mick and Keith, Brian Jones, the gang, and they loved it. The song was called I Want to Be Your Man, and it was the Rolling Stones' first number one single in England. Not bad. But more important than this, Can't go wrong the with effect it like had. Yeah, exactly. But more important than the fact that John and Paul could whip up a song this quickly, because we know they could at that point, they were so confident, is the fact the effect it had on the Stones. Because up until then, the Rolling Stones had really lacked confidence, even though their manager had kept telling them, you're, you're never going to last as a cover band. You have to come up with your own material. We know this. But when they saw John and Paul whip up a song of that caliber, I think Mickey and Keith thought, must not be too difficult. Maybe we should have a bash. So maybe you can thank uh, John and Paul for Mick and Keith's collaboration. You might also want to know that the story about the Stones not getting along with the Beatles is just that, a story. The Beatles were, were very responsible for many aspects of the Stones' success, including their first recording contract. George Harrison had recommended to Dick Rowe Decker that he go along and listen to the Stones, who were, recording, who were performing that night at a local club, and Dick Rowe signed them to a contract with Decker that night. So the Beatles did help them along. And uh, during the release dates, you look at the release dates of singles and albums, the Stones and the Beatles never release anything remotely near each other. That not only helped record sales, it also meant that they never had to compete head-to-head -head in the record market. So there's a little bit about the Stones. And they've got its catalyst here in German Street. We're going to walk past Harvey and Hudson up here. That's where John Lennon used to like to get his tailored shirts in the early 60s. So you'll pass that. We're working our way toward a rather popular art gallery area. Here we go. Right this way. popular gallery area. I'm going to ask you a question. Who was the first Beatle to get involved in the avant-garde art scene? Oh, Johnny. Johnny. The avant-garde art scene. Here John. Now. Wrong. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Nobody ever gets that right, so don't feel bad. It was Paul McCartney. <laughs> see, John Lennon had really gotten turned off on uh, art with the death of Stu Sutcliffe. He actually steered clear of the whole thing and had too many bad memories. But um, Paul McCartney didn't. He began to frequent the galleries in this area with his then-girlfriend, Jane Asher. He had a particular favorite in a Belgian artist by the name of Magritte, René Magritte, or Magritte. Now, Paul bought a painting of his that was of a large green Granny Smith. Hence the idea for the logo of the Beatles later on. You see, it hung over Paul's fireplace for many years. Before he ever used it. Yeah, of In any case, he would have been the logical person to come to if you were a young guy and you wanted to start up an art gallery. Right? Because he's young as well. Well, such a man was John Dunbar, who was married to Mary Unfaithful back in the 60s, before Mick Jagger got a hold of her and made her unfaithful. Well, <laughs> told you my jokes are bad, as bad as my Liverpool accent. There you go. In any case, He'd met up Paul through Mary Unfaithful, and he talked to him about investing. Paul said he wasn't interested in the business side of it, he just liked artwork. But he said, you know, you might want to get all to John. By this point, it's 1966. John Lennon's published his two books with his drawings in them. Paul thought he might want to have an exhibition. Not a bad idea. So he put John Dunbar in contact with John Lennon. Keep that in mind. I'm going to tell you the rest of the story once we enter Mason's yard. If you only use your imaginations once on the tour today, this is the place to do it. You need to see girls in the 60s, mini skirts, go-go boots, guys in a little mob suits, because you're about to enter an area that is virtually unchanged since then. So here.
might want to stand down there so you can get better shot. Okay. I'm trying to get out of your face. Yeah, no, that's all right. You can get what you're um, okay. what I'm talking about. Now, gentlemen, in this doorway over here, the first thing he saw was the step ladder, the magnifying glass hanging from the ceiling. So John climbed up, looked through the magnifying glass, and saw written on the ceiling one word. Do you even know what it was? You are here. No. Good guess. Why? Read me. I can't. With a bunch of cards turned face down. John turned over the top card, and there again he saw one word written. Yes. No. <laughs> Good guess. This is a little more difficult. It was breathe. And he liked that as well. So now he's really in the spirit of things. He goes walking along and he comes to a board hanging on the wall. In front of it is a hammer and some nails. The next to it is a small sign. It says, hammer and a nail, five shillings. Well, as I said, John's completely in the spirit of things. So he picks up the hammer and nail, starts to go to work. And that's the moment she knows the story now. That's the moment that John Lennon came, uh, that Yoko Ono came running across the gallery to stop him. Because it was her art exhibition John was witnessing called Unfinished Objects and Others. And she didn't want anything changed or altered until the official opening, which was the next day. Well, John Dunbar, sensing that Yoko's about to blow this deal for him, kind of pulls her aside and says, Look, Yoko, this is John Lennon, the Beatles. Let him do whatever he wants to do. He's going to give us lots of money. 